Amen. It's good to see you all tonight, and uh, I got to tell you a couple things about Brother Ben's message this morning. One, when he started with his text, I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to be all over what I got. But then I was reassured by the word of God, there's plenty of it to go around. Uh, we, uh, he, ref he referred to the verse that, uh, verses that I'm going to talk about tonight, but uh, it's really interesting how John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 both talk about what God did for us and the love that he has for us. Um, I'm going to be looking at John 3.16 through 18 tonight. Um, you know, I don't know if that's where the similarities will end with Brother Ben's message and mine. He got done early this morning. I don't know that that's going to happen tonight. It might. It could. But I'm not going to get your hopes up. I would much rather you be pleasantly surprised than being desperately disappointed. Okay? If I don't hear more amens than that, we're staying until 9. No, I'm kidding. All right. As we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, the title of the message is Believe It or Not. Believe it or not. And uh, that's really our two choices, right? Uh, we can believe it or not. This is not uh, uh, a message from Ripley. Okay, uh, everybody's been to the, maybe that. There's one. There's one over on I Drive, isn't there? Ripley's Believe It or Not, and uh, I think there's one in St. Augustine. There's probably others in other places, uh, but they usually have some kind of a fantastic uh, thing that happened. Or I think the tallest person that ever lived was a guy named uh, Robert Wadlow. Uh, Eight foot eleven point one inches, they say, at least in recent history that they know of. You know, uh, that, that's pretty tall. You know, I, I have a feeling I'd probably be looking right in the crook of his elbow if he was standing up here next to me. I don't know. Uh, he was a very young man when he died, though I think he was only 23 years old. And uh, so none of us, I don't think, were alive during his time. So none of us saw him. We've seen pictures of him. But based on that, we can choose whether to believe it or not. Well, we have scripture before us tonight in uh, the uh, group of books that we refer to as the Holy Bible. And we have the same option when it comes to this. We can believe it or not. And uh, my prayer is that you do believe it. Okay? I, I definitely hope and pray that you believe what the Word of God says from cover to cover. Because it is the Word of life. So when we look at this tonight, we're just going to look at four things. You say, well, there goes the short message right out the window. Okay? Well, just hang in there with me. We'll get some stuff done here tonight. So as we begin in John chapter 3, verse 16, we're going to go through verse 18, which is three verses. It says this, and most of you know what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's pray our Heavenly Father. God, pray that you'd use this message to your purpose, Lord, to your honor, to your glory. God, use me. I pray that it wouldn't be me that's out front, any of my abilities or inabilities, Lord, but it's strictly you and your word and your glory on display tonight. God, that's the only thing that's going to help people. That's the only thing that's going to change lives, and I pray that that's exactly what is seen tonight. God, we love you and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful passage that we have that assures us of everlasting life for trusting in you. God, forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we know this is stemming from a discussion between uh, two men. One of them happened to be Jesus. The other happened to be Nicodemus. He was a very wise man. He knew the law. He knew the prophets. Uh, he knew the wisdom books. He was, he was no dummy when it came to Scripture. And uh, he came to Jesus in the night. You know, and uh, there's different views on why he did this. But I really think that um, Nicodemus was curious uh, but was kind of worried about being seen talking a lot to Jesus by his peers. You know, uh, Jesus was not popular among his peers. As a matter of fact, it's his peers that uh, manufactured, if you will, the lie that uh, brought about the crucifixion of Jesus. 
And uh, I rather think that at some point we see that Nicodemus was was saved um, and uh, a fellow uh, like Joseph of Arimathea, uh, I believe he was saved. But regardless of the fact, G uh, Nicodemus got a very good lesson this night about what it meant to be saved, by what it meant to be born again. Nicodemus was raised during a time even though uh, the law was in place and they had the other books of the prophets and other things that I shared with you. There was also a very, uh, there's two main schools uh, of thought when it came to uh, the scripture. And they were rabbinic schools and uh, they, uh, uh, some, uh, some of them became what we call very pharisaical, very um, legalistic. And, you know, you couldn't only take so many day, uh, steps on a certain day, and if your ox is in a ditch, it's tough stuff, you know, whatever. You're just out of luck. You can't do this. Uh, and we know that Jesus debunked all those things during his ministry. So this is why he was very unpopular, because he was going against the school of thought. I want you to know, if you go against the school of thought that's out there today, you're going to be unpopular. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you're probably going to get canceled. Can I tell you what? You can only be canceled if you're worried about being canceled from the crowd that cancels you. And I tell you, there's a crowd out there that I could care less if they cancel me. Because I'm not looking for any fame or fortune through them. Okay? So when we look at this situation, <coughs> excuse me, Nicodemus had come to Jesus in the night and he was asking some questions. And Jesus shared some things with him that kind of uh, upset his apple cart a little bit. You know, marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. And, and Nicodemus says, you know, how can a man enter into his mother's womb when he is old and, and be born again, basically? And he says, no, that's not how it works. He says that, uh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. <clears throat> we know the Holy Spirit of God comes and births, if you will, the spirit of the individual that puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So then Jesus goes on to tell him how this happens, how this takes place. And uh, that's where we're going to pick it up. Actually, we're going to pick it up a little bit before 16, but we're going to... Uh, the bulk of the message will be 16 through 18. Um, you know, back up to verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? You know, if you know the word of God like you say you do, you should have been well aware that it was me that was coming. <clears throat> you should have been well aware of the things that I teach. But we see here, he says, Verily, verily, and uh, basically Jesus saying this is true, this is a true statement, I say unto thee, it, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and re, you receive not our witness. And if I told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And, <coughs> excuse me, and no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. If you will give me just one second, I'm going to put a piece of this gum in my mouth, and hopefully, uh, where it won't be so dry. Okay, and for all you mamas that get onto your kids for it, I apologize. Okay, so, but as we see here, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we see that, <coughs> excuse me, we see that here Jesus shifts something that would spark Nicodemus' understanding. He, he would get that. He would know the, the, the event in Scripture about where the, uh, braze, the uh, fiery serpents were sent upon the people of, of, uh, of Israel when they murmured and complained and, and when they were bit, if they did not look upon the brazen serpent upon the pole, uh, they, would be, they would die. And when that pole was erected and the brazen serpent was on it, obviously, they'd look upon that and they would live. Now, was it because that particular pole and that serpent had power? No, it was because by faith they would look upon it and they would live because they did what God said. So the same thing here in the respect of looking unto Jesus. Now, he absolutely had power. There's no doubt about that. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, folks, it's not about <clears throat> a charm that has a, a picture of Jesus on a cross or, or has a, some kind of a necklace that has Jesus on a cross. Jesus hasn't been on the cross for over 2,000 years. And he will not be on another cross. So it's not a trinket. It's not a thing. You know, this serpent that, that uh, Jesus is talking about, this thing was destroyed because the people took it and they worshipped this thing. It became a, a, an icon or an idol, if you will. And they, they felt like they had to have it in order to, to have God's good grace or something like that. 
I'm going to tell you what, whatever you got in your pocket, whatever you got around your neck, whatever you're wearing around your wrist, or tattooed on your forehead, if you don't have Jesus himself by faith, none of that rest of that stuff's going to be any good. So we see here that <clears throat> he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we know this is a future event that's going to take place. And it hasn't taken place yet, but it's been prophesied, it's been talked about, and again, this is something Nicodemus should have been aware of, but he was blind to because of the way he chose to follow uh, the school that he followed. So we see now, it says in verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, eternal life. We know eternal has no beginning, no ending. Okay, so when we see this, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a clear understanding. And this is the way I share it many times, and I don't know if uh, necessarily you agree with this completely, but something to consider. We see that in verse 15, Jesus says, whosoever believeth on him should have eternal life. That is the nature of the life that we receive at the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The life is eternal. Why? Because it is from the very Holy Spirit of God, who is eternal, who has always been, who always will be, he imparts that life into us. So the very nature of the life we receive has always been. And it always will be. But when we get down to the next verse of Scripture, the Bible says, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We see a similar statement. The matter of fact, that last half of that verse is very similar to verse 15. But they use the word everlasting this time. It's really interesting. Because even though we just studied in our, in our Bible class out here, the Bible tells us that God is from everlasting to everlasting. Okay? Everlasting to everlasting. But we realize that even in the understanding of this word, that everlasting can have a beginning. Now, when you use it in the context of everlasting to everlasting, you know, that means forever going both ways. <coughs> but we see this term everlasting. It is everlasting to us because we believed one day and then our new life started but it will never ever end never ever end okay so the very nature of the life that we receive is eternal but to us it, it started mine started april 23rd 1987 and many of you know the day that you started your eternal or everlasting life so but we see here that as we go through this it says uh, for God so loved the world. So we're going to start at that verse tonight. And first of all, we're going to look at the provision. Okay? We see the man is hopelessly lost without Jesus Christ. Jesus had told Nicodemus, you must be born again, back in verse 3 of this same chapter. And this had to be, this was a necessary thing in order to see the kingdom of God, he said. So this is the provision. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is how God provided eternal life to us through Jesus Christ. Okay, He gave his only begotten son. What does that mean? That means he wasn't forced. He didn't, he had, he didn't, nobody made him do it. He gave freely of his own will the son of God to be the sacrifice for our sins. Does that mean he loves us more than he loved Jesus? I'm going to tell you, God loves nothing more than he loves his son. But it sure makes us feel pretty important, or it should, that he would give that son, the only begotten son, for you and I, that we might know eternal life, that we might have eternal life. So the provision, God gave his only begotten son. And we realize that is the way. There is no other way to heaven. I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God makes a provision. We can't alter it. We can't change it. We can't add to it. We can't come up with some system that works in uh, uh, cahoots with it, for the lack of a better term. Work in harness with it. It has to be by Jesus and him alone because that's God's provision. See, we're hopelessly lost without the Lord. We are cut off completely because of our sin. And God said, this is the way. I have built a bridge. His name is Jesus, and you have to cross there. There's no other way. Okay? So that's the provision. Why? Because you and I could not provide our salvation. 
Because of our sin, we're marred, we're defiled. Anything that we did would not be holy. Only God could give that which is holy. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. The provision was his only begotten son. That's the only way it could work. That's the only way it would work. And this was God's plan for his provision for you and I. So if you've got friends out there that says we're all trying to get to the same place, say, no, we're not. I ain't trying to get there. I'm going there because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not working on any particular uh, uh, set of, of rules. I'm not working on any particular religion to get me to heaven. I'm trusting alone in the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's the provision. God, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus died once for all. He would never die again. Okay? So, matter of fact, the, the apostle, well, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay too. The Bible tells us in chapter 6 that if we were to fall away, Christ would have to be crucified afresh. That's not going to happen. Because, first of all, if you tr trust Jesus Christ, you're not going to fall away. And we're going to talk about that more here in just a minute. Okay? So the provision. God himself provided the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Just like he provided for Abraham on the mountain, just like he provided for everyone down through history, God provided Jesus Christ for our sins that we might know him as Savior and have everlasting life. The Bible says the gift of God, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Neither is there any other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. That's God's provision. Secondly, the promise. We move down to the second half of that. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the promise. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will not die. You will never die. You say, well, let's look at that here a little bit. I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit, but we're going to come back to it. Look down in verse 18 within the context of what's taking place here. He says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, condemnation is gone. The Bible says in uh, John chapter 5 and verse 24 that you have passed from death unto life. You passed up death like it was backing up the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not going to catch you at the next red light. You ever, you ever anybody ever do that? Pass somebody because you're just tired of following them and you pass them and they catch you at the next red light? And you think that they're going to roll their window down and go, hey, you got a long ways, didn't you? You know what I say to them? I just want to get in front of you. <laughs> no, but when we pass from death into life, there's no indication that we're going to go back. Okay? Ever lasting life. If it quit living at any time after we got it, would it be everlasting? No, it wouldn't. So everlasting life. The promise that whosoever, just so you know, everybody fits in that category. Every man, woman, and child fits into the whosoever. So when we look at that passage of Scripture and we see whosoever, we can stick our name right in there. And it applies to us that if we would trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, believe we should not perish but have everlasting life. Like I said, to me it started on April 23rd, 1987. And it's never going to quit. You say, preacher, this old, what, what, you're, what I'm looking at is going to die one day. You're absolutely right. If the Lord doesn't come back, this is going to lay down one day. And I'm going to cast off this body, but my spirit will never, ever suffer death. Because it's going to be with God forever. Death is separation. And death, ultimate death, is separation from God. I'll never experience that. You'll never experience that if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. So this is the promise. Listen, if you can trust anybody which that's a very loose statement, right? 
it's hard to trust anybody anymore. Does anybody still remember a time when you could handshake on a deal? Yeah. I remember hearing a story one time. So for those of you who don't know, I'm, I, I love the Statler brothers when they sang. And uh, they sang with Johnny Cash for eight and a half years. You know the only contract they had? And you know when they left? You know what they left on? They got paid, they got taken care of, and they never had anything on paper. It was just a word. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go back to where it could be our word that meant something? You know, and I ain't got anything against them. I'm just going to tell you that straight up, but I'm going to use that illustration here. There would be a lot less billboards for lawyers on, on the highway, wouldn't there? Yeah. And they've got, they've got their place and they serve their purpose. I get that. But listen, man, we're in, we're in a Sue Happy world. It's, it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. And there's somebody out there ready to help you do that. Okay? There are times when you definitely, definitely need a lawyer. You definitely need an advocate. But when it comes to the Father, we have an advocate. And that is Jesus Christ. Okay? So we have the promise that we have everlasting life. It will never end. 15 tells us eternal. Um, 16 tells us everlasting. It's, it's covered. Okay? It's completely covered. As we move on into verse 17, we see the purpose. For God sent not in his Son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Could you imagine God the Son, robed in human flesh, could have come down here to heaven, or come down here from heaven, and looked at all of us and go, you all a bunch of filthy sinners. You deserve to die. I hate all your guts. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm not about to give my life in this body for you. Well, he could have stopped short of coming from heaven, then, couldn't he? But see, his meat, the Bible says, was to do the will of his Father. And he came for the sole purpose. Remember what Jesus said when he was asked about what he was here to do? To seek and to save that which was lost. That was me. That was me one day, and I'm so glad he saw it after me. I really am. And I'm going to tell you what, if you've ever been saved, he saw it after you. And if you're not saved, he may very well be seeking after you today. The Bible says, call on the Lord while he is near. Seek him while he may be found. Okay? You said, well, I thought he sought me. He does. He knows right where you're at. Are you going to turn around and look at him? Are you going to turn around and trust him? Are you going to turn around and accept him? Because he is... The provision. He is the promise. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? And he is the purpose. He came specifically not to condemn, but to save. The whole world, that the world through him might be saved. See, this is the same world that we see in verse 16. For God so loved the world. Why did Jesus come? that the world through him might be saved, not to condemn them. See, because the condemnation is already in place if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now we see the penalty. That's the last point tonight, the penalty. Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Okay, If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. The penalty does not apply to you. You say, well, how long does that last? How long is the life that God gave you when you trusted him? Everlasting. Okay? So you're not condemned anymore. That means that you will not live forever without God. But, it says, but he that believeth not is condemned already. That is where you reside Right now, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're in condemnation because the penalty for your sin has not been accepted, or I'm sorry, the payment for the penalty of your sin has not been accepted by faith from you. It's there. Jesus paid that penalty 2,000 years ago, but you must receive the payment for that penalty by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith is how it works. So we see the penalty is condemnation. What's condemnation? 
That means you're found guilty as a sinner and you'll spend eternity apart from God in a devil's hell in torment and torture forever and ever and ever. Just as long as you will stay in heaven if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The punishment's everlasting. The punishment is forever. You would say, well, preacher, it seems rather obvious that people would choose eternal life. But you know what? So many people don't want to hear about it. So many people don't want to accept the fact that they think they can get there their own way. They have their own set that that way they can uh, do what they want to do and still get to heaven too. It doesn't work like that. You have to do what God says and you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. But the penalty is that you're condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That we can take back up to verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So we see that this is the same same per if you don't believe that God has given him for you, if you've never trusted him, then you're condemned already. That's why Jesus was sent. Did Jesus have to come into the world to condemn the world? No, because they were condemned already. But he came that the world might be saved. The last verse in this passage of scripture, or in this chapter, says in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath, currently, everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Can you imagine living your life with the wrath of God on you? Say, what does that mean, preacher? God hates sin. Loves the sinner. For God so loved the world. But God commendeth his love toward us, and while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Brother Ben mentioned that this morning. But the fact of the matter is, if you die without Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is already abiding upon you, and you don't have to wait for sentencing. It happens immediately. And once that takes place, once you die without Jesus Christ, there's no turning back. There's no other chance. This life now is the time of salvation. So, we see quickly. Believe it or not, we have the provision for God so loved the world. That's why he provided. We have the promise, whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The purpose, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but he came that the world through him might be saved. And finally, the penalty. If you don't believe, already you're condemned. But if you do, you will not come into condemnation. Man. Man. Think about that. It seems like a very easy choice. What's standing in your way tonight if you're not saved? A, you are. Because maybe you've got your own ideas. But I'm telling you, your own ideas don't cut it with God. It has to be God's way. Secondly, maybe the devil is influencing you. Ah, don't listen to that preacher. He don't know what he's talking about. You know what? Um, let, me, let me give you a quick illustration. Wrap it up. We'll go ahead and get ready for an invitation. Has anybody ever watched any game shows? You know the show Let's Make a Deal? Okay, if you haven't seen it now, maybe you saw it years ago with Monty Hall. Have you ever noticed there's one person that's contemplating on what to do and there's 500 of them back there saying, take the box, take the envelope, take the box. Why do they, they don't have a penalty. That's like, uh, that's like people on social media. Guess what? They'll tell you, this is what you need to do. They don't have to suffer your penalty or your consequences. What do they care? You need to do what the Word of God says. And not worry about what everybody else says. Okay? Because if you go home and you would have had a car, but the guy behind you convinced you to take the envelope and you got a, what do they call those things? Zonks or something like that? And you got, man... What is, is he going to lose any sleep over it? Absolutely not. He didn't lose it. If the devil's saying, don't you listen to that old preacher, he don't know what he's talking about. Guess what? He don't lose anything if you do. Absolutely not. So today, 
would you understand that you have to believe it or not? And I absolutely encourage you prayerfully to believe it, that God sent his own son, only begotten son in the world. Would you trust him tonight as we stand? Page 194.